So I will give the introduction in English uh, as a courtesy to our speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Professor Kretschmer, for joining us here today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for coming. Uh, as you might have read, uh, read uh, on our website when we were advertising the event, uh, Professor Kretschmer is a um, highly professor in humanities at the University of Georgia. He also has an appointment at the University of uh, Wilmington. And uh, he has, in his life, done a lot of work on linguistics, uh, which touches upon um, many things that we here do too. Uh, he has edited the American Linguistic Atlas Project for 34 years, uh, which is the oldest national research project uh, in, the, in, the, in the United States, serving how people speak differently across the country. Uh, and based on this, uh, he has also participated or carried out a uh, preparation of American pronunciation in the Oxford English Dictionary and for those of you who use Oxford English Dictionary, I'm sure there are lots of people here in the room that do. And he has been working extensively in corpus linguistics um, uh, as well as uh, and in text analysis. And um, I will just not make any further um, introductions, but uh, but give a very warm welcome and thank you for coming here and sharing your knowledge uh, with us. Okay. Thank you, Juan. There are still some seats up here at the front of the room if you want to come up to. Uh, um, no? Okay. <laughs> Scare people off already. Okay, well, I'm very pleased to be here in Krakow today to talk about how complex systems can be used for lexicography and text analysis. Uh, first off, I'm going to tell you about complex systems, since most of you probably don't know what they are, or have only heard rumors about this. Uh, next, I'm going to spend some time talking about how knowledge of complex systems can help us to understand word searches in a reasonable way. And finally, I'll talk about text analysis with specific reference to complex systems, because a knowledge of complex systems can help us to interpret our findings in text analysis better than we've been able to do in the past. So uh, at the end of the day, I hope you'll see that this is a new angle on both lexicography and texts, and that it can help you to do your, your work better. So, what are complex systems anyway? Some seats up in the some seats up in the front. So, um, so for several years now, I've been developing the idea that the science of complex systems or complexity science, as it's practiced in lots of fields such as economics or evolutionary biology or physics, is the best way for us to talk about speech, uh, particularly about the language variation that we see around us every day. Uh, these sciences are all known for their technical complication, but I don't propose uh, to talk to you today about the difficult mathematical side of complex systems, uh, but instead about the practical side uh, of complex systems. My point is simply that, okay, maybe there's some math underneath it all, but you don't have to focus on that in order to get the benefits uh, of knowing about complex systems. Uh, now, if we keep the big picture in mind, we'll know better what to look for in the behavior of groups of people of, uh, of interest to us, or groups of words of interest to us, and we'll know better how to interpret the information we gather for uh, lexicography and for text analysis. So, first, uh, we can think about complex systems with a set of key terms. Uh, for any complex system or complex adaptive system that you'll also hear called that, uh, we have to have random interaction of a large number of components, so lots of pieces. Uh, that this interaction constitutes activity which is essential to the operation of the system. That if a complex system dies, if the activity stops. As the interactions continue, the components affect each other in what might be called an exchange of information about uh, the contingencies of the moment. That is, the components share uh, bits of information depending on what's going on around them, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether there's an earthquake, whether uh, no matter what happens. Uh, this exchange of information leads to reinforcement of behavior among the components and thus to emergence of stable patterns in the complex system. All of this with no central control, so that patterns just happen uh, because of the process, rather than because somebody has 
caused them to happen. Uh, so what do these stable, stable patterns look like? Really, any number of things. Uh, the human body is a complex system with lots of subsystems that are also complex systems. Uh, an ant colony, or a beehive, is also a complex system in the behavior of the bugs. Uh, our economic markets are complex systems, whether we're talking about the national market, or the international market, or any local market. Uh, for each of these examples, you can imagine what the components, the activity, the exchange, uh, uh, reinforcement, and emergence might be. So, for uh, to talk about just one example for a moment, uh, this is your immune system. Uh, and the components are all the kinds of cells that can bind themselves to invading antigens in your system, like a virus or bacteria. And in this graphic, the T cells are the crucial ones that do this. Their activity is to be carried around in the blood, and they randomly interact with each other as they do so. When they interact, they exchange information about what they have bound themselves to because the cells attach themselves to the antigens. And there's lots of different kinds of them that can attach themselves to different sorts of things that appear in your body. Uh, and reinforcement occurs when lots more cells that can bind to a specific antigen are created in order to fight some disease that you've got. Now, a frequency profile emerges among the cells of the immune system that changes in response to invading antigens. As we see here in the graph, going from left to right, lots of cells are formed to fight a disease when it's present, as in the middle of the chart here. Uh, and then the system returns to a more balanced profile of cells when the disease has been beaten back and you're healthy again. Now, however, the end of the process at the right is not the same as the process at the beginning. The system learns about diseases as it goes creating what we call antibodies, so that it's easier to fight any antigen again once the immune system has seen it before. We see this here in what the graphic calls memory, the larger frequency of disease-specific antibodies at the end of the course of the disease. So a complex system like the immune system is not just a mission, not just a mechanism that can only do one thing. But instead, it's a living strategy that can cope with events as they happen. Uh, the ability to learn, to change in response to conditions is what makes the complex system perfect, not just for the immune system, but for other situations with changing conditions as well, like insect colonies, economic markets, and I argue, speech. Now for the, for the spoken part. Uh, the randomly interacting components in the complex system are all the possible variant realizations of linguistic features as they're used by human agents, all of us as speakers. The activity in the system consists of all of our writing and all of our conversations. Uh, the exchange of information is not the same thing as the meaningful content of what we say. Uh, that's a different kind of exchange. Uh, but instead, the implicit comparison of the use of different components by different speakers and writers as they use them in different settings for conversation and writing. That is to say, we hear how people talk about things uh, as well as what they mean. Uh, feedback from exchange of information causes reinforcement in that speakers and writers are more likely to employ particular components in future occurrences of particular circumstances for conversation and writing. Uh, human agents can think about and choose what we say, uh, and we do that. But that doesn't uh, change the basic operation of feedback and reinforcement. <coughs> We're making choices in relation to the system. The order that emerges in speech is simply the matrix of components, whether it's words, or pronunciations, or constructions, grammatical constructions, that come to occur in local settings, uh, in regions, in social groups, and in all of the settings for speech and writing in uh, which we ac actually communicate with each other. The process operating in complex systems just explains better what we already knew. We tend to talk like the people nearby. 
either physically or socially nearby, and we tend to use the same linguistic tools that others do when we're writing or saying the same kind of thing. Uh, this is why students read a subject at college uh, or at, uh, in graduate school, that the uh, students need to interact with other people and learn how to talk all over again in their, in their new subject. And that those of us who are teachers, that's what we do. We talk. They listen. And it happens. Now, finally, we know that languages change. Uh, we have no examples of fixed, invariant languages unless, like Latin, they no longer have a living population of speakers. Uh, the complex system for Latin has quit, and the language is what we aptly call a dead language. Uh, all living languages, though, Polish, English, anything, uh, continue to change in response to changing conditions. Now, that's the big picture for complex systems. So, uh, what does the actual data look like? Uh, when we look for evidence that a complex system has been working, we always see two things. We see a particular frequency profile, and we also see the scaling of that profile in every size group and subgroup we look at. This scaling property is confusingly also called scale-free. But that means that the same thing happens at every level of scale, whether you say scaling or whether you say scale-free, sort of like inflammable. Does that mean that it's going to set on fire or it's not going to be set on fire? And, and, uh, it's one of those confusing things in English. Okay, so here is a slide of all the different terms for that uh, for the American uh, insect. You know this one, you know, dragonfly, it has some wings, it flies around, it eats mosquitoes. Um, now, and these terms were collected from 1,162 speakers in our survey of speech in the American Eastern States. Now, the first thing to notice is that there are lots more terms for the same thing than you ever could have thought. For dragonfly, 119. Now, you know what? Uh, many Americans know several, but nobody knows them all. Uh, so, uh, these are just the top 30 that were elicited the most often in the survey. Now, I've arranged them here by frequency so you can see just how common a great many of the terms are. Seven different terms occurred more than 100 times each from these 1,100 people in the survey. Now, here's the rest of the list. Yes, I know it's too small. You can't read this. But uh, the uh, thing that you can see is that they have all these ones and twos. Uh, after the terms. So 83 of those 119 different terms only occurred once or twice. Now some of these are mistakes, so that uh, the term snake leader or snake peter or snake weeder, uh, when the speaker probably meant snake feeder, which is one of the common ones. Uh, other items have an S on them, so dragonflies instead of dragonfly. But even if we take all of that stuff out, then we still have a huge number of different terms, so that this pattern is robust to mistakes and to uh, the way that you collect the data, uh, the way that you put it down. Uh, so, um, in a, uh, some variety that we're describing, if we ask whether people say snake doctor or skeeter hawk or darning needle when they mean dragonfly, uh, as when we used to try to draw a line on a map and isogloss, some of you may have come across this as a way of marking uh, linguistic varieties, then we are asking the wrong question. Uh, the best question to ask uh, about a matter of usage in any variety from the complex systems perspective is, how many different ways can people say that? Uh, the next question to ask is, how often do people say each one of them? And if we ask these questions, we can see the frequency profile, which otherwise we would never we would never see at all. And of course, the important thing here is that any single one of us won't know all of this stuff. That you have to go out looking for it. You have to do a survey, or you have to listen closely, or you have to read a corpus, or look things in a corpus in order to find all of this stuff because our individual separate 
perception of language in whatever language you're talking about will not be good enough. You won't know all of this. So, um, when all of the frequency variants of a linguistic feature are graphed according to those frequencies, the chart is going to have a small number of highly frequent responses, those are the ones at the left, and a much larger number of uh, infrequently recurring responses. Now, I call this an A curve because the actual technical name for the way that graph looks is asymptotic hyperbolic curve, and I don't want to say that anymore. So I just say A curve instead. Uh, now, this is a slide for the dragonfly responses that I just showed you. But the distributions in my survey data always have this shape, without exception. And just to show you that uh, it's not just a dragonfly chart, here's a slide uh, that shows the A curve for all of the different realizations of the trap vowel from 64 southern U.S. speakers. It's from my uh, current sociophonetics project. There are 38,817 tokens. Those of you who do any kind of phonetics know that this is sort of unbelievable. The usual chart like this has five, ten uh, on it, but this is this is what we're doing now in the digital humanities is uh, large scale, more large scale things. So uh, when we look at our data, then we need to keep in mind that the distribution of the components scales to different levels of analysis or it's scale through, uh, to use the other term. And this is what that looks like. Here's the same A curve in two more plots of the trap file using exactly the same data I just showed you. Now we see the same curve just for the women on the left and just for the best educated speakers on the right. The curves have subtle differences, but the shape appears clearly in each graph, uh, both the overall sample in the last slide and in these two slides. And it occurs in all of the subsamples of my Atlas survey data, and in every survey in any language that I have ever seen. Uh, roughly the same list of variants for the trap file belongs to each subsample. The women, the highly educated, the overall groups, so all of the individual words uh, or pronunciations are represented in each of the groups. But the frequencies of each item in the list varies for each group. So in this case, the, uh, there's the most common way to pronounce this vowel, but then there are also uncommon ones. But the frequency profile of whether women say a vowel will have different ones at the top than when other people say it. Or when highly educated people say it, it'll have different ones at the top than when other people say it. And this is always the case. So, uh, this is how we can be sure that we have different varieties of a language, whether it's English or Polish or anything else. And it's how we can tell them apart. So, complexity science tells us about the process by which order emerges from massive numbers of random in interactions uh, among components in the complex system of speech, rather than from a simple cause or any set of rules or anybody in charge. Now, for text analysis. Uh, just to show once more uh, the generality and relevance of a nonlinear pattern, now in a corpus setting, here are the top ranked collocates of undergo as reported by Michael Stubbs. This was back in 2001, so he didn't have any idea that he was talking about complexity science. Uh, now, it certainly has the shape of the A curve when we graph the list. The long tail of the curve is cut off here since Stubbs only reported the most frequent collocates. You can imagine that this graph actually continues over the wall, thereabouts, with all the different things that collocate with the word undergo. Uh, of course, we see a similar pattern every time we make a new word list in a corpus. Those of you who do corpus linguistics know that function words in English, like articles and prepositions, are always the most common. So much so that we often create a stop list of 150 or 200 words in English uh, so that we can study the content words like Stubbs did with Undergo. Of the 1,205 times Undergo appeared, the word surgery was used near it 108 times, which is 9%. Now words at even the 1% rate of collocation 
like transformation at the bottom of the list, some of you probably can't see that at the back, uh, occur nearly 200 times as often as they would have occurred if language was a bag of words, as the natural language processors say. So clearly, we don't have a bag of words. Um, now, in Stubbs' test with corpora, well over 90% of the no words have a top collocate with a rate of occurrence of at least 2%. Thus, it's clear from looking at the numbers that words are not deployed randomly in speech, no, ran uh, no bag of words, and they don't appear evenly spaced throughout a text. A curves for collocate frequencies are built right into the complex system of speech. Now, the A curve is not just numbers. The distribution of words on the list tells us something about what we mean by the word undergo. So here we're shifting our role towards lexicography. Uh, looking at the list of top collocates, we can see that besides surgery, there are other medical terms like tests, treatment, the word medical, operation, and some others. So we tend to use the word undergo when we're talking about medical care. Uh, words like forced and required tell us that such treatment is uh, often not optional, so that if we undergo something, some condition has happened to us that makes us do unpleasant things, uh, like tests and operations. Undergo is thus not a nice word. Do you want to undergo something? Thank you. Um, if you're saying that you are going to undergo an interview, we're going to think that you don't, want to, you don't want to do this interview. It's painful somehow. Uh, or perhaps you might say such a thing because it sounds ironic. Uh, but the, uh, the complex systems lets us go with the majority use, or occasionally when we think to do it, we say something that would go in the tail of the curve, too. So the dictionary, and as an old Oxford guy, uh, I'm referring here to the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, says that in its broadest sense, Undergo can just mean to experience something. Uh, but it also says that undergo means to endure or to suffer. Uh, and the OED also has no fewer than 18 other definitions of the word. But what the OED does not say is that the frequency of these meanings is no more random than the collocations are. Uh, if you want to find out more about the frequency of these, you have to read Patrick Hanks's New Oxford Dictionary of English, not the OED. Uh, and the New Oxford American Dictionary is based on the same, same way of doing things, so that this is a mode of lexicography that you could follow. So, uh, in most dictionaries, however, words uh, don't have lists of meanings as they appear to have in the dictionary. They're embedded in domains and acres. So the A curve tells us which of those meanings are more frequent and also identifies a domain, medical care, where the word is commonly used. This is an example of the scaling behavior of the complex system. That out of all the domains where we could use words, medicine is where undergo turns up. Uh, the semantic prosody that undergo is not a nice word carries across the different specific meanings and domains as the word occurs as a more general sense of how the word is used uh, on top of its dictionary meanings. We can see, therefore, that the acre frequency pattern in the complex system of speech is intimately involved in how we use the word undergo, in fact, how we use any word in the language, and even if you didn't realize it, a curves from complex system are the foundation for Stubbs' brilliant discussion of his corpus evidence. I think it along with some things that John Sinclair wrote, like this book in 2001, is one of the best I've ever prepared. Now, let's turn to a particular example of how we could use corpus tools in service of lexicology. Uh, the word firecat is not found in the dictionary, and yet it occurs in the poetry of the American poets Wallace Stevens and Hart Crane. Uh, we now have a fine public on, uh, we now have fine public online corpora which can be searched for instances of undefined words like firecat, and the web itself can be used as a corpus in order to find examples. The results of many such actual searches that I'm going to illustrate today do reveal instances of firecat, but there are problems in the result sets. 
Some online corpora reveal no hits and others just a few hits. On the other hand, large online corpora and the use of the web as a corpus render too many hits. And the instances of Firecat in such cases have only a tenuous connection to the way that Wallace Stevens or Hart Crane used to work. Uh, the big question then is how we should interpret all those results that we get back when we do searches. The application of principles from complex systems helps us to make a better decision about what to do with Firecat. So, first, let's look at the poetry. Uh, a while ago, a colleague of mine uh, put me onto this that he'd seen the word Firecat in Hart Crane's epic poem about the American experience called The Bridge. But he couldn't find the word anyhow. He didn't know what it was. Uh, Firecat is not an OED, and it's not found in the citations for the OED. Neither is the word found in common American dictionaries, and Firecat was not noticed in that great American historical dictionary, uh, the Dictionary of American English, uh, or the Dictionary of Americanisms. In the, the Crane poem, the word is not exactly self-defining. It seems most likely to be a naturalistic reference to an animal found along Colorado Stream somewhere, maybe on Altmore. As it happens, the word firecat also appears in uh, Wallace Stevens, and here the firecat is usually interpreted as an Oklahoma mountain lion. But again, we don't know what it was. Uh, at least one report thinks it's a uh, steam engine. So. Uh, so let's go online. Let's try to figure out what Firecat means. Now, if we do a general Google search for Firecat, uh, as I tried it recently, of course, this will change on a daily basis. Uh, uh, it returned the following results on the first page. Now, all of these are commercial references. Uh, one link refers to Firecat with the cat capitalized, the catalog of security add-ons for the Firefox browser. It's a sort of blended acronym. It has nothing to do with animals. On the following page, another link refers to the title of a children's book. Uh, the, at least the children's fire cat is a sensible blend, a sensible term for a cat that you find in a firehouse. But we're no closer to Crane and Stevens when we, uh, when we see these things. Other entries later in the Google list are also commercial, a site for fan fictions based on Japanese anime and comic books, an online marketing and strategy firm in Texas, a JavaScript web server product, a pottery company, the model name for an Arctic cat snowmobile, uh, and the uh, model name for an archery bow, and here's something you'll recognize, um, something more familiar if you're old like me, uh, the name of the 1971 Cat Stevens album, Teaser and the Firecat. Now, the big hit on that album is called Moon Shadow. Can you still hum this? Jan can probably do this. Moon Shadow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. See, many of you are too young. But, um, but that's the, that anybody who was alive then would hum it because it was on the radio you know, a hundred times a day. So, uh, most of the commercial references like Cat Stevens in Google are repeated many times. Uh, two of the only non-commercial links in Google do refer to names for real animals, although both animals come from Asia, not America. And here they are. Uh, the, the first is from a site devoted to how wonderful tigers are, uh, and the Asian golden cat apparently falls into that category. Firecat is a translation of what Asian locals are said to call the animal. Uh, the other, on the right, uh, is a nickname applied by the cable TV channel Animal Planet. Uh, do you have that one here in public? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think children like this a lot in animal lovers. Uh, but it's a name that are applied to red pandas in one of their nature documentaries. So the first several pages of Google uh, links tell us nothing helpful about the poems. Should we believe that Firecat survives only in blends, colorful commercial terms, and nicknames and translation and from TV producers? Maybe not, because Google apparently manipulates its search results. Uh, there was a recent Wall Street Journal report on 
how they don't tell you the truth about um, uh, their uh, results. And keywords can also affect results. So if we're not going to do Google, let's try to do something better and use WebCorp, which was a tool created by my friend Antoinette Renouf and has been modified uh, over the years. Well, Google does allow for advanced searches. WebCorp does a much better job for linguistic searches like ours, both for its presets on domains of interest and particularly because it allows case-sensitive searching, which is important. Unfortunately, my web course, Case Sensitive Search of UK Newspapers, which is nine tabloids, uh, returned only one hit, which was an ad advertisement for a snowmobile. Um, snowmobile? Britain? Really? But there it was. Uh, my web course search for all of the .uk domain turned up 43 hits on 22 sites. Besides the ad for the snowmobile, there were four references to Cat Stevens, several references to computer software, some comments about Japanese anime, and a blog for the Poetry Society talking about the Wallace Stevens poem, our first one. Uh, the UK academic domain on um, WebCorp found 15 hits on 14 sites, nine of which were duplicates. So you've got to watch out for how the counts work. The case-sensitive feature of WebCorp got rid of most of the commercial hits, mainly Cat Stevens stuff, uh, though some are still there, but that's little help with our poems when nobody seems to use the word in a non-commercial way. Perhaps the UK is the wrong place to look. Uh, but things were no better for four large US newspapers uh, when you do those on WebCorp, and it returned case-sensitive hits only as the screen name attached to some restaurant reviews in the Washington Post, uh, the U.S. academic domain was better with 23 hits on 16 sites. Three returns were Wallace Stevens poem, although nobody has noticed our print um, in there. Two more about Cat Stevens, one about a snowmobile, a couple about computers, and a couple of screen names. There was one hit for a natural, if metaphoric use of the words, uh, a reference to the fire cat imagination of Sherman Alexi, uh, another poet. WebCorp then succeeded in helping us locate uncapitalized uses of Firecat, but they just weren't very many. Now in comparison, let's look at uh, LexisNexis, uh, which found 148 non-case sensitive hits for Firecat over a 10 year period in its preset domain for major US and world publications. Now, the vast majority of these were references to Cat Stevens. Uh, the significant minority of returns were references to the Florida Firecats, a now defunct franchise of the American Arena Football League. Uh, in a more specialized search of LexisNexis, uh, this is a you know, 5 billion word bounded virtual corpus from 10 years of American newspapers, rigorously sampled by region by my former student Garrison Pickerstaff there were 161 returns. When the search was filtered by Firecat and not Florida and not Snowmobile and not Teaser and not Brand uh, and not Band, there were still nine returns, but again, only one hit in the last 10 years was natural and not commercial, though still metaphoric, that is a tough yet sweet Firecat of a woman in a journal reader. Uh, LexisNexis doesn't normally do case-sensitive searches, but you can use a no-caps command for this purpose. Uh, use of no-caps in the bounded virtual corpus again yielded the same single non-commercial use of Firecat. Even with the best tools and manipulation of commands, commercial uses dominate, plus some use of Firecat as a screen name. Non-commercial uses are very rare and seem to be metaphoric and there are no occurrences of literal substantive uses of the word to represent anything like a mountain lion, as we would hope to find for the poem. So let's just flesh this out a little bit. Uh, if you search COCA, uh, you will find two returns out of the uh, couple of hundred million words there. Uh, then I looked at the 19th century books and periodicals on the American memory site at our Library of Congress. There were no hits at all. Uh, a search of historical American newspapers found two non-commercial hits, 
one from 1942 that antedates the animal pet planet reference, and another from 1922 that's uh, the same as what we saw before in a drama review, a fighting, flirting fire cat of the Irish ghetto in New York. Uh, so time matters in the search, whether the distance of a century or a shorter time. So, from our results, nobody appears to use fire cat like Crane or Stevens did. Uh, what all of our searching has really taught us then is that what really makes a difference is where and how you look. Google returned 1.9 million links. Uh, well, it said so. I didn't count them. Uh, American Memory returned zero. And the corp uh, Coca Corpus returned just two. WebCorp UK newspapers returned one case-sensitive hit. And the other WebCorp domains returned a limited number. Uh, LexisNexis gave us 148 hits. From uh, its set domain and the bounded virtual corpus gave us 161, of which only one was a non commercial use. Uh, we could be led to think that Firecat was a common word by the Google search, or that it hardly existed by searching American memory, COCA, and the UK newspapers. No single point of view gives us the best answer because every point of view, every search, gives us a different answer. Uh, for the frequency of the word. This is what complex systems predicts because of the scale-free property. Every level of scale you look at will tell you something different. It will have basically the same stuff, but all the frequencies will be, uh, will be off. Moreover, the proportion of hits from each domain uh, that correspond to the different typical uses of fire, fire cat is also different. Different domains have different proportions of Cat Stevens, of computer software, of snowmobiles, of screen names, of sports teams, uh, even references to the Wallace Stevens poem. Uh, genre has something to do with this, of course, but so do location, time, and a host of social and discourse variables that are hard to track online. In short, as I said before, the big question is not getting results. We always get those, but what are you supposed to do with them? Uh, we simply can't be too quick to think that we really know what we have. If you're doing lexicography, you want to be fast. You know, you have to you have to get the column inches done. I understand that. But if you go too fast, you completely miss what's going on. So, the complex systems model helps us understand what may have appeared to be erratic results from our Firecat searches. The general Google search is not useless but you really have to be careful when you interpret it. Just knowing that the returns will be distributed in a nonlinear fashion uh, allows us to understand why a few common commercial uses with Cat Stevens at the top seem to dominate the listings. At this top level of scale, commercial manipulation and duplication of entries will always be too small to affect the overall shape of the curve, just as I showed you if you take out mistakes or morphological differences, that the curve is robust to that. It's the same thing. The LexisNexis based search um, helps us to deal with the numbers problem in that searches in restricted domains give us smaller numbers, and we can actually make an anchor of those, uh, and establish which uses, like Cat Stevens, are really at the top of the curve. The smaller scale of the domain we search is not a problem, because of the scaling property that makes acres appear in any subsample we choose. Now, the array of domains on WebCorp and case sensitivity feature gives us a quite different view, still one that requires interpretation. With case sensitive searches, we greatly reduce the number of commercial hits, but that's not evidence that the word is not found very often in Britain. We still have an A-curve-like distributional pattern if we interpret the small numbers of hits in each case according to the complex systems model. Here, manipulation and duplication can really get in the way if we let them, but they're also easier to identify. If you only have 14 hits and nine of them are the same, you'll see that. Uh, in cases where only one or a few valid hits come from the search, we'll be in the position of trying to estimate which uh, estimate where the one use or a few uses, uses might occur on an acre if we had enough data to make one. 
The single hit in UK newspapers was for the snowmobile, not for Cat Stevens. And we have to understand that it's a possibility to get a single example from lower down on the frequency profile. Um, it's highly likely that our single hit or our few hits will come from the top ranked varieties on the curve, if we could make one. But there's also a decent chance, about 20%, that a single hit is actually an uncommon use somewhere in the long tail of the curve. Therefore, when the amount of evidence is very small, we should especially avoid the temptation to make categorical interpretations. For example, that Firecat is a snowmobile uh, in, from our work on UK newspapers. Or to assume that the results are necessarily typical of the domain that we search. For example, that UK Newspapers typically use Firecat to refer to snowmobiles. We just don't know that. Uh, similarly, for American sources, we shouldn't think that metaphorical uses of Firecat are just as common as references to Cat Stevens, because they're not. In the case of subsampling and smaller <coughs> numbers of returns, the best interpretation will be one that assumes the nonlinear pattern and attempts to fit the actual returns to that pattern as well as possible. If you only get two hits, they're most likely to be the same. And if they're not the same, they're highly likely to represent two very different frequencies of use. And we should always recognize that searching any particular domain will not yield a result that's always generalizable to a larger or a smaller domain. All of the levels of scale are independent in complex systems. You can't look at a lower level of scale and use that to say what everybody says. So, what should we say in the end about Firecat? You know, putting on my lexicographer hat here. Uh, I think we should trust our evidence, even though most of it's commercial. Firecat is usually either a blend or a metaphor. There appears to be no good evidence online for Firecat as the name of a real creature like a mountain lion. Instead, there are some blends like the common compounding strategy in the fire cat of the children's book, or the common blending strategy in making fire cat from the pre-existing pre forms fire fox and catalog. Even more of the commercial uses seem to follow a cognitive blending strategy. Thus the word fire has a number of typical associations in its cognitive schema, and so also does the word cat. The blending of these two cognitive schemas selects those typical characteristics of fires and cats that overlap. This is, you know, like Offman Johnson, ancient history, I'm sure you know uh, about the, this cognitive side. Uh, this is just the sort of uh, thing that creative advertising and creative product naming seeks to do, thus its appearance in commercial terms. The best interpretation, then, of Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens is exactly this kind of metaphoric extension that, like the nicknames for Asian cats and pandas, has a little more of the physical sense of a cat involved. According to this way of thinking, we really shouldn't be so concerned about a possible generic difference between commercial uses of fire cat and non-commercial natural uses of the word. We found no evidence that a fire cat was a common name for a real creature on which non-commercial fire cat metaphors could be based. So we should understand both the commercial and non-commercial metaphoric uses of fire cat are coming from the same cognitive blending strategy. Okay, so for to go back from lexicography to text analysis, I'd like to pick that up with you now. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Jan's favorite author, Hemingway. Uh, who was just telling me about earlier, did you know that his grandfather was the one responsible for uh, plot development and shooting people in a farewell to arms and, and well, I'll let Jan tell the rest of the story. This was amazing to Yes. Okay, so uh, just to confirm the point about nonlinear distributions, here's the beginning of the word list and the chart from Hemingway's novel, A Farewell to Arms. The, as we expect, is at the top of the list. And Hemingway's, uh, Hemingway has I and U near the top, when a general list, that is from the ground corpus, wouldn't have them there. Uh, this, of course, is evidence for what uh, Doug Biber has called an involved 
as opposed to an informational register uh, and involved is appropriate for a novel. The thing to see here is that the A curve appears just as the complex system model predicts, and it will appear at different levels of scale, whether if we uh, made a list for all of having these novels and not just this one, or if we made a list for any subsection of the novel. Uh, this kind of self-similarity at all levels of scale creates a fractal pattern, as first described by Mandelbrot. Some of you may remember his work in 1977-1982, all these pretty pictures of uh, graphical things where there was a big thing and then it was repeated as a smaller thing and then a still smaller thing. Uh, it was even put on clothing uh, at the time. I can remember wearing fractal shirts, you know, and probably these are all not interesting to you, but uh, it's historical. So, the fractal structure of language is a different way to talk about many of the problems that text analysts have known about and tried to cope with. Our interest in sampling, knowing where we get our data, is certainly the best practice, as opposed to the NLP approach of the more data, the merrier, no matter where it comes from. Uh, we need to be able to identify every scale of analysis uh, and not just trust that all speakers and writers have the same grammar, which is an assumption of natural language processing. Text analysts have also learned to use specialized statistics, and now we know why. Language data sets are never normally distributed. They're always nonlinear. And so we need to avoid statistical approaches that assume normality and prefer statistical approaches that don't require it. Since we always get the same frequency profile at every scale, this A curve, uh, what we most need to do is to describe how the language at any scale compares to the language at another scale. Not in the general graph, but in the order of the elements on the curve. We can compare part to whole, like the subsection of a novel to the whole novel, uh, or we can compare a whole to a whole as one novel compared to another novel, or as uh, Hemingway's Farewell to Arms uh, with a general corpus, like the Brown corpus. And that's what I'm going to do next in uh, an example, something that's one work is composed to something that's supposed to represent all of them. So in every case, we're going to be interested in how words in one data set are higher or lower on the curve than they are in a different data set. So, here's a list of 50 keywords that are more common in Hemingway than they are in the Brown Corpus. Uh, it, and I put it in order uh, using the log likelihood method as generated with the free program AntConc. Uh, I've removed single letters except for I, you know, as a, a pronoun, and evidence from contractions. So the numbered list goes up to 61 and not just 50. That's why it looks kind of funny. Uh, I and you are on this list, as I've already discussed, along with various character names and words related to the story of ambulance drivers in rainy Italy. Obviously, this list tells anybody who's read the novel all about the novel. Uh, this is low-hanging fruit. You know, this is what, don't you show this to your students all the time? You know, things exactly like this. It tells you all about it. One thing I did once was I wrote this book called The Linguistics of Speech. And I made a list just like this one for linguistics of speech and put it up in front of my students and it told them what the whole book is about. It was just a, a great exercise. This works with anything. Okay, so uh, now we're going to look at a tool that was programmed by Stephen Coates, uh, a former student of mine who now teaches at Old. Uh, and he wrote it in JavaScript and Python and the Bokeh environment. Uh, and it gives you numerical data after a hundred word stop list has been applied. Uh, and it makes comparative visualizations. So the tool allows both linear and loss scale views. Now of this A curve, if you do log scale, it makes it a straight line. So that's what you'll be seeing. Uh, here we see the word darling as it appears in Hemingway and Brown. It's in the 95th most frequent word in Hemingway, but it's 5,335th on the Brown list. Uh, and it has a log, high log likelihood score. The, this, this visualization uh, clearly shows that the two red points are far distant from each other. Uh, oops. 
there's Darling, there's the log scale. Uh, that they're far different distance from each other. One, if you could read the scale, 1.5 order of magnitude difference in the frequency. Now, this is an effective way to demonstrate visually that Darling is much more common in Hemingway. Now, let's look at a few more of these plots. Here are the numbers for the tool, uh, from the tool for the word rain, a uh, somewhat less common word with a log like it length could score about half the one for Darling. In the visualization, uh, we see that the two red points are about one order of magnitude different. Here's the word nurse, uh, still less common in Hemingway and less frequent in Brown, with a log likelihood score about a third of the one uh, for rain. The visualization shows the two red points are less than one order of magnitude different. So far, then, the visualization has matched the log likelihood scores pretty well. Darling is more of a Hemingway word than rain, which is more of a Hemingway word than nurse. However, uh, one more visualization shows that the numbers may not always be in step with the picture. Uh, the numbers for the number, th uh, number three ranked keyword, said, show a massive log likelihood score over three times larger than the score for Darling. When we look at the visualization, though, uh, the red points are less than one order of magnitude apart on the log logarithmic scale, so that the difference looks more like the one for Nurse than like the one for Darling. In this case, the very high frequency of said, way up at the top of the A-curve, appears to have influenced the log likelihood score to make it appear that said is more different than it appears on the visualization. The same is true if we remove the stop list and expect the two top keywords according to log likelihood pattern scores, I and U. Uh, I is a very frequent word in both data sets, but it shows a difference of less than one order of magnitude on the log scale plot. U uh, is just the same, a very frequent word, but with a difference of less than one order of magnitude on the log scale plot. So, in these cases, the visualization acts as a correction for the log likelihood numbers, which said that these were really important. When you look at the picture, not so much. The reason for this appears when we shift the visualization to the A-curve display of raw data. So, for Darling, uh, the red point has shifted from the long tail of the curve in the brown corpus to the steep upward part of the curve in a farewell to arms. You see that over on the right, it's kind of down in the infrequent stuff, and it's gone all the way around the bend uh, in Hemingway. The said distribution, on the other hand, does have a large frequency difference, but the red points are both on the steep upward part of the curve. This difference, changing location on the section of the A-curve, might be thought to play a role in the importance of a word as an indicator of Hemingway's special use of language. The visualizations for rain and nurse can be read in the same way. The red points for rain have moved up uh, from the cusp of the curve in brown to the steep upward part in Hemingway. The red points for nurse have moved from the long tail in brown to the upper section of the cusp, almost to the steep upward part of the curve in Hemingway. In both cases, we see a change in the status of the word, perhaps more stable than the change for Darling, or uh, more subtle than the uh, change for Darling, but still present from uh, one of the sections of the A curve, uh, the upper or the cusp or the long tail, to another section. Uh, this suggests that frequency alone may not be the whole story in the comparison of words between corporate. Uh, corporate. So, uh, a warning to people who just look at numbers and statistics. The reason is here. Uh, we might think of this change in location on the A curve as corresponding to the psychological status of high frequency versus low frequency words on the curve. High frequency words are common, usual, and understandable, while low frequency words are more flexible for use for special purposes or for personal identifiers. If a word changes its status from low frequency in a broad balanced corpus like Brown to high frequency in Hemingway's novel to become one of his common, usual words, 
then we should pay attention and grant value to that fact. So in text analysis, just working with the numbers and not with the underlying distribution may not always give you the best answers. And complex systems gives you a way to observe that. So now at the end of what I wanted to tell you today, uh, we see that complex systems uh, may offer a new means to resolve formerly intractable issues, but even better than that, complexity science at the same time builds new bridges between linguistics and other disciplines like physiology and economics. Right now, whether or not you want to cross those new bridges as I have, we can consider what the linguistics of speech has told us about the relation between language and use and generalizations we want to make from it. I invite you to look at this A-curve and scaling right now, whether you're doing lexicography or text analysis. When you know the most basic principles of complex systems, you can begin to adjust your expectations about what you see in speech and language and make <coughs> general, better generalizations about them. Okay. Thank you for your work. I'm sure we have some questions. So go ahead and tell me what you think. In the paper, I noticed that the coefficient was smaller. Mm -hmm. like the more frequent the word was, and the word was, or how did it work? Because for Darwin, I think, and Hemingway's uh, and, uh, and work, I think it was like it was lower than in the brown corpus. Okay, we can, in all of these comparisons, um, well, we'll just look at this one for rain. Then, in the brown corpus, it's 1,495th, which means it's somewhere down the curve. And in Hemingway, it's 121st, which means it's at some higher level on the curve. And that's what the difference between them is. You can also look at uh, rate of occurrence, uh, which is what the, uh, uh, the relative differences in the, the rate of occurrence, which tells you something that, that these are different. But when you, when you look at that, what you want to do is see this is the... Uh, logarithmic picture that makes a straight line, that in the brown corpus, it's lower on that line. And in the farewell to arms, it's higher on the line by something less than one order of magnitude. That's what these things are saying here, 10 to the zeroth power, 10 to, 10 to the first, 10 to the second. And so each box is an order of magnitude on a logarithmic scale. And order, one order of, uh, one. Those are my tens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, ten, a hundred, a thousand. You know, as you as you go up. So if something is an order of magnitude different, it's different by about ten, uh, ten times as much, and by two orders of magnitude would be a hundred times as much. And what we're seeing is things between one and two usually, but that's between 10 times as frequent and 150 times as frequent, something like that. Thank you. Okay, so basically would you agree that we're sort of back to zip in that, who doesn't, I mean zip doesn't look at word frequencies, it looks at words, at number of words in frequency. Mm -hmm. So it's rank. So would you say that rank is more important than actual frequency? Well, yes. That zip, first of all, was we everybody knows zip. Zip's law. Did you know that he was uh, a professor of anything at Harvard? He was a super genius. So he could give lectures on anything he wanted. But he was also a complete nut, uh, a complete crazy man. So I prefer. Not to talk too much about zip. Yeah, because uh, I, mean, it's, it's, so, I mean, looking at those diagrams, you never use the word once. No, and the reason is because zip 
made the, this principle of least effort, and he talked about all sorts of bizarre stuff um, in connection with it, and the um, uh, it, it's basically rank, a relationship with rank over frequency that gives you a nonlinear curve like that. Um, he only found it as words and texts, but I found it everywhere. And I've shown you lots of different places where it happens. Zip was a really smart guy to notice this, but he didn't see the big picture. He didn't see what was really happening, and that's what I showed you today. Uh, and that not only does it happen in speech, but it happens in other places, like in your immune system or in economic markets. Uh, now, Ziff, in proposing a law uh, about rank over frequency, uh, says that the difference between the top ranked item and the second one, the second one should be half as frequent as the first one, and the third one should be a third as frequent as the first one. This practically never happens, that it's not a law, it's guidelines. So that when you get this nonlinear curve, sometimes you get one thing that is very common and the next one is about where Zip said, but sometimes you get two things that are pretty common at the top. Uh, that happens about 15% of the time. If, uh, sometimes you get three or more at the top, and that happens about 5% of the time. So actually, you have an A curve of A curves in this way, which, you know, in, in the fractal world of speech, it's not, it's, I just think it's cool. Um, and we can do curve fitting. I have done curve fitting. If, you're, if you really want to do the statistics of curve fitting, I'll drag out another talk and keep you here another hour, and you can do that. But um, let's not. Uh, let's just say that these curves can be, let's just look at a curve. There we go. These curves can be very sharp, like this one. In my phonetic data, they're more like this. It can seem a little bit shallower. But I can prove to you that none of these are normally distributed, and they're all far from being normally distributed, they're, they're all nonlinear. And so that's the guidelines part. But sometimes, uh, the, in Zipf's law, the theoretical relationship between uh, the theoretical depth of the curve is about 0.75 in a, a sort of proportion that I use, and that sometimes your results will be 80-20, uh, which is what the economists have said in the past, was 80-20 will you may have heard of. But sometimes it's 90-10, sometimes it's 70-30. It doesn't matter. It's still a nonlinear curve, and the nonlinear curve uh, does this for language. But this is, this is how language works. It's how you learn language. Now, which linguistic features do you learn first? These that occur all the time, all around you, providing quality data. Oops, uh, no. Oops we got, there we are. They provide quality data for children to learn. Uh, or do you learn these that hardly ever happen? You tell me. I mean, it's just obvious how uh, language acquisition works. That uh, by experience in your environment, that's what, that's how people learn things. And uh, when you think more about it, you, you can see how this kind of perceptual difference between things that occur all the time, regularly occur all the time, or are rare, uh, informs our human behavior about what kind of things we study or what kind of groups we're in. You talk different in your family than you talk at the office. And uh, that's part of acres like this. What are, the, what are the things you usually say in your family? And then some of those you don't use at the office. Uh, or at least you're not supposed to. You get charged with sexual harassment if you uh, So that's the, um, uh, this just runs through all kinds of behavior that we have. Uh, and it's a, rather than zip just being a one-off thing, if you read, if you're a natural language processing person, you read the normal textbook, Zip's law gets one page, or four pages, or something like that. Then they forget about it and tell you about the bag of words and vector analysis and all this other stuff. 
I won't say the bad words about it, but um, uh, all this other stuff, when actually they have just missed the, the most important point about people talking. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. If I if I may go back to lexicography for a yeah. sec, um, since like several people in people in this room are uh, what's on have are practitioners in lexicography. We, mm -hmm. we we don't do any LED, but we do uh, some other uh, dictionaries, mm -hmm. dialects, you know, um, historical Polish language, uh, contemporary Polish, and so on and so on. Uh, so we'd be very very much interested in any recommendations how to use the uh, the knowledge you're presenting us in our everyday, uh, you know, lexicographers' work. Mm -hmm. uh, you were showing the uh, example of the fire cut, and mm -hmm. uh, you suggested that we should follow the suggestion by Google that most of the usages are uh, commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in practice, if anyone uh, opens a dictionary, he or, she, he or she would be interested how to understand this, this body poem, right? When mm -hmm. the, the word fire cut was used. Mm -hmm. So how to how to marry those two approaches using your uh, well, the, the best example is what John Sinclair did first in the Collins Dictionary in English in 1988, Corpus-based dictionary, and the, um, uh, followed up by Hanks in, in some Oxford dictionaries, is to include the idea of frequency in a dictionary. The, in various dictionaries, you can line up meanings for words historically, uh, say the oldest meeting and then other meetings, or you can line them up in random fashion. But what they did was that they put the most frequent meaning at the top and uh, considered related meanings to that one. And then if they had another frequent meaning that was quite separate, then you would put that one down second. And whatever meanings were associated with that, you would put down. But the framework of the way that you put variant meanings into your dictionary is going to be affected by this. So that dictionary readers should know what a word commonly means, not just separately all the different things that it could mean, and that this makes all the difference in making a good dictionary. Now, if you're making a drugstore dictionary that has just one single word equivalent in another language, you know, Polish this, English that, uh, won't happen. Uh, but those diction it tells you that those dictionaries are not really wonderful, uh, in that they ignore the possibilities for more meanings, and there are always more meanings, uh, and it also ignores the frequency. So that if you have a sort of bigger dictionary, that you're making a more complete dictionary in any scale you want, whether it's a dictionary involved in some area of business uh, or a dictionary of uh, a dialect region or a dictionary of who knows what, uh, then you can decide to arrange your meanings in the way that, uh, that work according to frequency. And that that's the way that's the way that I would implement it. And that when you're searching data, that it's useful to use Google, but that's not the end of the story. You know that you will you will never find the sort of blended meanings, the kind of single blended meanings that show you how Firecat is working if you only use Google. So you should use multiple sources and take more than three minutes. You know, to do a quick search, say what a word means, and move on. I'm sorry, you know, that the general editor will be unhappy with you because you're not making your column inches, but responsible lexicography requires a little bit more time than that. Uh, I come from the old, lex I started doing lexicography when I was an undergraduate on the Middle English Dictionary, and we had sorting boards. This is before, the, before computers at all. But on a sorting board, you can imagine a board like so that had uh, layers in it where you could take slips, like what used to be used on the OED, and stick them and sort them out on the sorting board. And what you would have in some parts of your sorting board is a thick stack. And other ones would have a single slip as you were sorting out meanings. And that shows you the same thing as the computer does. 
Uh, but when you're only using slips, then it's a little harder to be quite as Catholic about trying to check things out as you could do today on the web. Okay. Yeah. So, so under the, the, the fractal nature language. Yes. So but you might be interested that a few years ago I've been asked to help a bunch of physicists, actually specialists in complex systems, mm -hmm. who are applying that to uh, sentence length distribution in literature. And and they came up with this beautiful result that Finnegan's weight is a multiform. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was it was like distribution rather so basically oversimplifying much less regular mm -hmm. than traditional novels, and then we sort of had to push them to actually look at the the whole stream of consciousness novel, and that's where it got multifactorial, mm -hmm. and which in the end to the humanist is not really very. It's like the the the, the reaction would be duh, mm -hmm. but to the physicists, I mean they they made some pretty. Beautiful, colorful pictures. I oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, fract fractals are all about exponents. Now, when you took trigonometry in school, were you like me that I had the math book up on my desk, but behind it I had Lord of the Rings, and I was reading <laughs> Lord of the Rings during the trigonometry class. So I don't know about exponents, um, but the I have since had to learn something about exponents and about logarithms. Um, but logarithms are not something that anybody pays any attention to, but they are beautiful things. If you have, what was that movie about the, the mathematician of beautiful mind? Yeah. Is that it? That it's true that there's a kind of beauty to these things when you get outside. Well, all of us are trained in dimensional studies. So uh, zero dimensions is a point, no dimensions at all. Uh, two points make a line, so that's one-dimensional. Two-dimensional makes a square or a rectangle that has space in it. Three dimensions make a box. Fourth dimension, we don't know what that is. Uh, maybe time, you know, boxes over time. But this is the only way we have been acculturated to think about the world, is in terms of one, two, or three dimensions. What I've been showing you today is fractional dimensions. You know, 2.4. Well, what does that look like? We don't know what that looks like. Nobody ever trained us to think in that way. But when once you realize that actually the world is arranged that way, uh, think about a tree. So a tree starts with one trunk, and then it sort of splits, and then it splits, and then it splits, and then it splits, and it's a complex system. And it has a uh, dimensionality uh, that is fractional somehow, not just squares or lines. Uh, and we see it around us all the time, but we just don't see it. And so that's why the physicists were excited, is that they were seeing, when you say multifractal, what you mean is self-similar at different levels of scale, so that you see the same picture where, wherever you look. So if you see a picture um, just in front of your eyes, if you zoom in, you see the same picture. And you zoom in again, you see the same picture. But that's what they're talking about. And this is, in the sense of a beautiful mind, it's a beautiful thing to mathematicians. Uh, on the other hand, since it's not dimensions that are integers, then these are called monsters by other mathematicians. And that's why Mandelbrot was not accepted for this brilliant work on fractals in the 1970s and 80s, because all the mathematicians that only worked with uh, integers as exponents just thought this was all nuts. Um, and it took a long time to figure out what was going on, but if you look at all you have to do is look out the window to see that buildings are square, but nature is not. Uh, where do you have 90 degree corners in nature? I mean, they're just aren't any. Because nature uses this other kind of sense of dimensions. You can use it for coastlines. You can use it for ferns and plants. Uh, you can use it to describe how cancer grows. 
uh, if you want to be a little more morbid about things. And uh, things that happen in nature are, are very often fractal. Which doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about buildings. I'm not sure I want to live in a fractal building. I mean, that would be disorienting. But at the same time, you know, I want to understand the building, but I want to understand the tree as well. And I'm just telling you that speech is more like trees. Uh, thank you so much. Do we have, we have still time for one last question if somebody has one? Or if not, then we can wrap up. Thank you once again for, for the talk and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I would also like to use this point to say that we'll have another at the Digital Humanities Lounge uh, in just a bit over a week next Friday and it will be um, dedicated to a project that, uh, that was created here in the Institute um, the Corpus of Spanish di uh, Regional Dialect, uh, with Professor Kochal Stefanek and Michał uh, Woźniak and Professor Kulski. Um, so please keep the state in your calendars as well. We will be sending out the information um, soon. Yeah. And thank you once again. And, um, <laughs>